coming in here at Annabelle's Cafe to get my drink. It is delicious, the atmosphere is great, and Philip is a very, very nice person to everyone when they come in. Hey, give me a good cup of coffee. Give me a word that rocks me. A whole lot of Jesus and a little caffeine. You and my awakening. Hello and welcome to Down Home with Jerry McKee. I'm Jerry McKee. And I'm Sophie Mitchell. And we got a treat for you. Uh, literally, right? Mm -hmm. Sweets coming up. Right. You'll be able to see some home cooking that's going to just make your mouth water. And Sophie and I is going to bring you a little uh, hot cider, and you'll see that also. But right now, we're right here with Joy Ivy of Sanders uh, Garden, and talking about some beautiful decorations. She has them here. Now, Joy. Uh, I noticed you got a lot of live trees. Uh, what are some of the helpful hints that you can give people that buy a live tree? Well, the most important thing is to keep it watered. You want to keep the tree, the trees were cut day before yesterday. We water them, actually sprinkle over them at least twice a day to keep them uh, as fresh as possible. We cut the bottom off the tree so that it can take water in. But once you get it home, you have to make sure every day that there's water in that tree stand so that it will stay alive as long as possible and most importantly, not be a fire hazard. Okay, now I know sometimes people have uh, trees like this in their home where they water them and they can, uh, it's got like a, a root base that they can plant them. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have those also? Or? I do not. Everything that we have is fresh cut. I understand because a lot of people that has those have to come in a certain environment and have mm -hmm. to be uh, planted in a certain environment for them to right. really live. Yes. Now, what else uh, here at Sanders uh, Garden here, I see a lot of decorations and uh, what are some of the decorations that you have here for people with a tree or anything? Well, we also make fresh cut wreaths. We take the greenery from the trees and make our own fresh cut wreaths with bundles of greenery if you want to decorate with those. We have ornaments. Um, we have flags, uh, house flags, the large flags, the small garden flags. We have ornamental door hangers for the season. Um, we have lots of mugs, um, just about any kind of ornament uh, that you could think of. Wow, I know just looking around the store, I see it just makes it like you're walking into a Christmas wonderland yes. here. And, uh, and I know it takes time to decorate this you know, to, to, for each season. Yes, we actually started decorating for Christmas in August. Wow. So that gets, see, the ones that put the tree up early? You ain't got nothing on Joy here. She, uh, <laughs> she starts way earlier, and you have to in, in retail. Yes. And uh, so I invite you to come to Sanders right here, right beside Ace Hardware on Buffalo Highway, right here in Union. So you got a good place to come to buy your tree, get your decorations, and make your holidays joyful. Thank yeah, you. with joy. <laughs> <laughs> so coming up next, is you're going to know how to make a sweet potato souffle. Uh, Sophie was helping with this. No, you was helping with the blackberry cobbler. Yeah. She got the good part. Uh, so we're going to be going to a lady's house, and that's uh, Lisa Golden and uh, Crystal Lanier, and they're going to show you how to make a sweet potato souffle. Stay tuned. Hello, we are right here in Lisa Golden's kitchen, along with her sister, Crystal uh, Lanier. And we're standing right here to bring you some holiday treats. Their holiday treat is what's going to be, it's going to be a delicious sweet potato souffle. 
If you ever went to a place and you ate some, it wasn't good, well, here's the recipe for you because I've ate theirs and it is fantastic. So stay tuned. They're bringing this recipe right to your doorstep. Hey, I'm Lisa Golden. And I'm Crystal Lanier. And today we're gonna to be making for you sweet potato souffle. Um, it's a wonderful Thanksgiving side dish. It's very easy to make. Our ingredients are here. First, you start with sweet potatoes. You need five medium sized, and you'll bake those in the oven for about an hour until they're soft. Once they're soft, you'll peel the, peel the uh, outside layer off. Can't have any good southern get together without sweet potato soup put Put the insides in a large sized mixing bowl. It's a little messy, so I hope you don't mind getting a little messy. We never. Then you'll mash them all up and get them good and smooth. Once you get them good and smooth, you add two large eggs. Get your chicken, so why that this morning? Mm -hmm. Then you add sugar, just regular white granulated sugar, and that you need one cup. soft when you put it in it makes it easier to mix whole stick and one and one half teaspoon vanilla extract milk. And we're gonna measure it with this so you know it ain't right. And you don't need the milk at all. And then just a pinch of salt. And you mix that all up really good. While she's mixing it, I'm going to grease our little pan. And I'm going to set the oven to 350. And you can use butter. Um, I use the cookie. And then once that gets all stirred up nice and good, it goes into the pan. Does that look good? And then we make the topping. And the topping is pecans, brown sugar, flour, and more butter. But that, sure you're not Paula Dean? Paula Dean. To dry the milk, clean the milk out of our measuring cup. 
and these have to be finely chopped and I use the food processor to beat them up a little bit before I got here. And you need a cup of packed brown sugar. And pack it down in there good and make sure you got a cup full. Another messy job. And that only needs a half a stick of butter. No, this is just been setting out. And a half a cup of all purpose flour. Then you mix it up good. Take all the paper off your board. I know you know I did one time with the grilled cheeses. It's all good. That's true. You did make this grilled cheese sandwiches. I left the plastic on the cheese. But you didn't forget it, did you? No. What you might get at our family festivities. I might should have let you melt that butter. Yeah. Well, I thought with it setting out like that, it'd be softer than it is. Before it will get that butter. Good. been a sought after dish at our family's holiday parties. We don't have Thanksgiving or Christmas without a sweet potato supply. And it's kind of one of those things you ask who's making it so you know if you'll like it or not. Our sister-in-law actually makes a pretty good one she too. Does. And sometimes we wind up with two. But we don't we don't wind up with leftovers. Pop that in the microwave on about 30 seconds. Sometimes we um, decide if a restaurant is good and we like it, whether or not they can make sweet potatoes and play. And there's one in particular that makes superb sweet potato soup fly. Wade's. Wade's. Brandy's makes good topping, but the mom. Yeah, you may want to melt your butter a little bit before you put it in. I thought that would be soft enough since it's been sitting out for a while. It was not. And you really just mix this up until it gets crumbly. Right. You have a, a real crumbly consistency. All the powder will be gone and it will be chunks of yum goodness. And sometimes when it clumps up, um, it's just as easy to go in and mash them up with your fingers and mix it up. But once you get it mixed up, and that's what it looks like, you just spoon it over your Sweet potato mixture, even it out on top, and this is what makes it so very good. You can't go wrong with butter and brown sugar in my book. That's true. 
too much there. Some butter. Some people like marshmallows on top of the sweet potato. Um, you could substitute this topping just for marshmallows, but why would you? Give away sweet potato casserole. I just talked. Then it goes in the oven. And we're it, just gonna put it on this pan so that it'll be it's more stable. That and in about an hour, you'll have your sweet potato soup. While you just bake it until it's slightly browned on top. Um, depending on the oven, it could be 40 minutes to an hour. You just kind of look at it from 40 minutes every few minutes until it's brown on the top and then you take it out and it's ready to eat. This is the finished product. And you can see it's all nice and brown on top. And then when you cut into it, it's nice and creamy in the inside. It smells amazing. The whole kitchen smells good. And now that you have your recipe, you can enjoy your sweet potato souffle for the upcoming holidays. I'm Crystal Lanier. And I'm Lisa Golden. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. I don't know about you all, but I love coming to Ellie Bell for coffee and for having our class. What about you? Awesome. Yeah, it's a wonderful place to... I think I'm addicted to the hot chocolate. I'm addicted to the coffee. Great coffee. Energize me. Come and wake me up. I will wait upon you, Lord. me come and fill my cup I want more and more give me a good cup of coffee give me a word that rocks me a whole well I hope you enjoyed the recipe for the sweet potato souffle it is delicious and I know it's going to be delicious for your table coming up next Sophie learned how to make a blackberry cobbler and how did it turn out? It turned out really great. It was surprisingly easy to make. So now we can expect maybe a cobbler for Christmas? Maybe so. Yeah so it's real good and it's so simple and we want you to watch see how simple it is and uh, you'll really be surprised. It makes its own what crust? Yeah it makes its own crust from self-rising flour. Perfect. You know I can't make crust or biscuits or anything like that, so this is really a plus for me. So stay tuned and watch and learn how to make a blackberry cobbler easy and quick. I'm Sophie Mitchell and you're watching Down Home with Jerry McKee. I'm here with Tracy Kirkland and she's going to show us how to make a blackberry cobbler. Okay, the first thing you want to do is to turn your oven on 350, get that nice and hot. And you want to put the butter in the pan and let that be melting while we're mixing our batter. And it's a good idea to put your pan on a sheet, sheet pan but, um, to keep it from spilling over. Who's got time to clean an oven during this time of year? And we'll just let that be melting. And then you want to take two cups of flour and two cups of sugar and 
you want to mix this up pretty good. That prevents the, the flour from clumping um, when you add the milk. So we're going to add that up, mix this up like this. It's good. And then we're going to add two and a half cups of buttermilk. Pour that in there nice and, ooh, that buttermilk's so rich. And then we're going to stir that up good. If we hadn't have stirred the sugar and the flour up first, the, the flour would clump really oh, yeah. bad. It smells really good. It does. And just give that a good whip right there so you get it mixed up really good. And I like to add vanilla to mine. Everybody don't, and it's optional. But I like to add a, um, one and a half teaspoons of vanilla to mine. Let's get that mixed up. Now the butter has to be completely melted. I believe our butter is melted now. And we're gonna take the pan out of the oven. Now this recipe, you will need a nine by 13 pan. But if you want to make one smaller, you can always, you know, half the recipe or, or you could double it to make one bigger. But we just want to leave our butter in there just like that. We're going to take our batter and pour into the pan around in, in the butter without mixing it up. Just like so. And then you take your fruit. Now this recipe calls for one can of 20, 21 ounce for a can of fruit. Um, you can use any fruit to make this recipe. So if you like apple cobbler, you can make apple cherry, peach. And you just take your fruit and spoon it in all in, in different areas of the cobbler. Just to spread it out evenly. The blackberries are hard to find sometimes because they're not in season right now, but any, any fruit will do and it's just as good. Now, without mixing it up, this batter will cook over the fruit. So it'll, it'll completely cover the fruit up when it cooks. And you wanna cook this on 350 for one hour. And I have one finished here. This is what it, the finished product would look like. But it's real simple. Anybody can make this. This recipe goes with any holiday dinner. And you know, when you push for time this time of year, you mm -hmm. want to make something that everyone would love. This is perfect, perfect to make. Yeah, I can't believe how quickly you put those ingredients together and did that. And the fact that it makes its own crust is is awesome. Now, one thing I didn't say in the beginning. The flour has to be self-rising flour. That's, that's what allows it to bake over the fruit. Mm -hmm. But it is written on my recipe. Okay. Now you guys know how to make a blackberry cobbler, thanks to Miss Tracy. Thank you for letting us into your house and showing us how to do that. You're welcome. Merry, Merry Christmas. Christmas. We got another treat coming up for you. It's called haystacks. And what haystacks is, is like 
these morsels of uh, butterscotch along with uh, chow mein. Doesn't sound like it'd be very sweet, does it? Mm -mm. But it is very, very good. We went to Brian Harris, his kitchen. He invited us in and he's gonna show us how to make haystacks. It's another simple making candy idea. And Sophie and I are going to bring you, you know, it's, it's been getting cold lately, hasn't it? Oh, yeah. And it's chilled to the bone and you always like to have something hot. A lot of times in the mornings you drink a hot coffee, right? Sometimes. But you know what? Guess what happens late in the evening? You maybe not want that coffee, but this hot cider is going to be fantastic. And Sophie and I are going to bring it to you. And I'm going to use her as a taster. And uh, so, ah, this is something good. So stay tuned and watch for some haystack candy and great hot cider that's easy to make. Hello, I'm Jerry McKee with Down Home Jerry McKee. I'm here with Brian Harris in his house, in his kitchen, and he's gonna show us some wonderful treats, haystacks. You don't know what they are? Well, you're gonna find out what they are. They are delicious. We have them every year at our family gathering. He makes a big batch of them, and he's gonna show you how to do it and what they look like, so you will be able to do this during your holidays. So stay tuned. Well, hello everybody, and welcome to my kitchen. What we're going to do here for this show is we're going to make uh, one of my family's favorite holiday treats that I'm sure a lot of you out there have had. They're called butterscotch haystacks and they have been around for many, many decades. And my grandparents from Lockhart, South Carolina used to have them when I was a young boy. And we just grew up with them from time to time having them for different occasions, especially at the holidays. And they're very easy to make. So before we get started cooking, I want to show you everything that that you need to have ingredient wise and utensil wise that will be beneficial for you. Uh, we have here on the stove a six quart pot. You're gonna need that. I'm gonna go ahead and take the lid off. And I already have it pre-warmed so that when I put in the ingredients it will start to melt. But I like to keep it on low. You do not want anything higher than low for what we're about to make. The other ingredients that you will need, you will need two bags of these Nestle butterscotch morsels. They're readily found at just about every grocery store, Target, and places like that. Uh, but you'll need two bags of these. Of course, in addition to the morsels, you are going to need some creamy peanut butter. Uh, this jar is 16 ounces and it's more than enough. I will not use the whole jar of peanut butter and I'll talk more about that later. If you want to use the extra crunchy peanut butter because you like a little peanut in it, that's fine as well, but I always use creamy, I just like that. Um, then in the Asian food aisle of any grocery store, you can find a bag of chow mein noodles, la choy, that's what I always use. Um, I usually get two bags. I might use the entire two bags. It depends on, after I get it in the pot, how much I need, but you'll definitely need one bag for sure. Uh, possibly two. So go ahead and buy two. They're about $1.50 to $2 a bag depending if on, sa on sale or not. Uh, they also come in a can too and if you buy the can of chow mein noodles also made by La Choy, you get two cans for sure because they're a little bit smaller. The bag has a little bit more and there are 12 ounces of chow mein noodles in this bag so you need about somewhere between 12 and 24 depending on the ingredients that go in the pot in just a minute. Um, as far as other things, you will need some wax paper. You'll see I've already torn off some sheets over here because once we get the mixture made, I will use an ice cream scoop to scoop the actual candy out and drop them all over the wax paper so that they can harden. You will need a scoop to get peanut butter out or a big spoon will do. And of course a wooden spoon to stir the things in the pot. Don't use a metal spoon in that kind of pot you could damage it so I guess we are ready to get going with this Jerry so we'll go ahead and come over here to the pot and I already have one bag of the butterscotch morsels opened up so I'm just going to dump those in and I may as well go ahead and open the second bag and pop those in and if you're not familiar with the butterscotch morsels, they always have some great recipes on the back of this. And they actually have their own version of butterscotch haystacks right here on the bag in case you forget, right there. 
But anyway, we've got the two bags of morsels in there and now it's time to add the peanut butter. And here's the, the trick for making these come out right every time. You only need one third peanut butter to the two thirds morsels. If you put more peanut butter than morsels, then the problem is gonna be that they will not harden. They'll be gooey and you want it to harden just right. So make sure that you scoop out an appropriate amount of peanut butter. You can see what I'm pulling out here. Just let it fall in. I need a little bit more. Actually, this spoon that I pulled out is a little small. So let me get the spoon. All right. Making a mess here too. All right, so I still have a little bit of peanut butter left in here. I didn't use the whole jar. I can always add a little bit more later if it needs it, but I think I've got it just right. And we are ready to let this thing slowly melt. All right, and what I'm doing is just taking this wooden spoon and a slow stir, let it melt naturally. Don't try to rush it again. If you put that thing on high, it's easy to scorch. So I've learned that from years ago. You don't want to fast melt, so be patient. It will take a little bit of time and you just keep stirring. And I can already start smelling the goodness over here right now. This is what it looks like right now. See that, Jerry? Just a big old goo. But anyway, in just a few minutes, this goo will turn into like a soup. It will look soupy. Melted peanut butter and the melted morsels. So a lot of people out there in TV land, I'm sure, like I said, have probably had this, but uh, a story that goes along with this particular candy is when I was in school uh, at Lockhart High School, there was a teacher that, if anybody during my era went to Lockhart, you probably had Miss Falaw for home ec. And I can remember back in seventh and eighth grade when we would have that period in the day when you would have your, what they used to call the round robin schedule, be it PE, typing, art, or home ec. When you had your home ec block, one of the things that she taught us was this particular candy. So it was real easy for middle school students to do, and I'm still making it now, and it's real easy, it's not hard. So a lot of my Lockhart classmates, they can probably go back in time with me. Tracy Rash, Julie Gibson, Susan Sprouse, Hines, Tracy Farr, Christy Martin, Mark Inman, Stacy Knupp, all of you out there can remember being in that class with me and having a good old time in Miss Falaw's class. All right, we start to get that soupy look now. So it's gonna be ready in no time at all. And it's probably melting a little faster right now because I already had it pre-warmed a little bit before we started filming. The smells are divine. Makes you think of Thanksgiving and Christmas for sure. I know it's gotten to the part at my family, every time a holiday rolls around, I'm expected to make, to make these to bring or they'll get mad. So this is gonna be perfect for the upcoming holiday season. All right, it's coming to a good consistency now, so it's not gonna be long before I add in the chow mein noodles. Too bad you people can't smell this, it smells good. All right, so here's what I'm looking at now. I can see a few of the beaded parts of the morsels, but just in another minute or so, they're gonna be completely liquefied. And we're just about there. All right, so at this point, let me cut open the first bag of chow mein noodles. And what I usually do is just pour in a good heaping of them. Maybe not the whole bag at once because you wanna like bathe that butterscotch soup with the noodles. If you put the whole bag all at one time, it doesn't mix as well. So anyway, you got this going on now. Just turn, turn, turn. It's like you're giving those noodles a bath. I was in the grocery store one time buying this product 
to make these and there was a lady in there she asked me what I was making and I told her she was amazed that I was buying these chow mein noodles she said I thought they were potato sticks ooh that no potato sticks in this at all that'd be greasy all right so you can see what this is turning into and I still got a lot of goo in the background so I'm ready to add a little bit more noodle maybe finish this bag off there we go Continue the bathing of the noodles. I know a lot of times when I'm making this, I feel like it's not gonna be enough butterscotch soup to cover the noodles, but it always seems to work out. Another shot. Looking good, smelling good. And this candy definitely gets its name, Haystacks, because, well, it looks like a haystack. Some people use the peanut butter morsels, but I think it needs that butterscotch morsels to mix with the peanut butter. If it's all peanut butter, it doesn't have that special taste. So I highly recommend that you stick with the butterscotch morsels and your favorite peanut butter. I always use Jif. All right, so I think we're to that point now where we can start scooping. So what I'm gonna do, put all my stuff out of the way. Now what I'm gonna do next is I'm gonna slide this pot over and I'm gonna take that ice cream scooper and I'm gonna scoop out uh, the right amount that I'm gonna need to make the individual candies and uh, let them harden on the wax paper. It usually takes about an hour and a half, two hours before they're ready to eat. Not too very long, so it's a quick candy to make. All right, so here we go. If you have the kind of ice cream scooper like most people have where you can click the thing and drop, that's even better, but I've got this modern kind and it works. And you can see in just a minute what it looks like when I put a few on the paper. And it's okay if it drops a little here and there. It's, okay. it's all right, it's all good. Just do your best to make them as close to the same size as you possibly can. And in one batch, you usually get about, I would say, anywhere between 24 and 36 haystacks, depending on the size of your ice cream scoop. I'll put a few more out here on this wax paper so you can see. And then we'll fast forward a little bit. When you're making these, just remember to be patient. Don't get in a rush. It'll be done in no time at all. And the main thing that I want you to remember from this little cooking class is when you're making these, make sure that your ratio of butterscotch morsels to peanut butter, you don't want as much peanut butter. You want two thirds morsels to one third peanut butter. So if you make an even bigger pot, you gotta adjust using simple math. And it will come out perfect every time. All right, so I think that's enough. You can get a good zoom in, Jerry, of what they'll look like. And like I said, within an hour and a half to two hours, they are ready to pull off that wax paper and take to the party. Well, now you know how to make haystacks and with the perfect recipe, we want to thank Brian Harris for letting us come into his home and for him bringing it to you to show you how to make the haystacks. As you can see behind me and some of the footage, uh, they're going to be delicious. They got to sit a little while before you can eat them, but you know what? You start smelling that aroma, aroma and then you're, you're going to get hungry for them. Yes, you so, will. so Brian, thank you for letting us come in. Thank you. And stay tuned for more cooking. Happy holidays. Happy holidays and Merry Christmas. the end 
towards the end of the show and guess what we're going to show you how to make Jerry's apple cider but there's a little bit more to it than just apple juice and Sophie's going to help me that way she will know exactly how to make it for the holidays just like these other treats you've been watching but the first thing we want to look at we want one 64 ounce of apple juice yeah go ahead and hint it yeah that way I don't reach over it's rude to reach over I use the Mox 100% apple juice <laughs> they like Bob Barker's beauty set and uh, it's the 64 ounces right here and make sure you got a big enough pot so 64 ounces we will pour you're gonna say wow all you gotta do is heat up apple juice oh no there's a little bit more to this I'm worried now <laughs> okay the next thing we want to put in is rudely reached over here again is <laughs> cranberry juice but not 64 ounces we want to put 48 ounces of uh, it's actually original cranberry juice cocktail so let's get the cocktail right on it it's uh it's does make a little bit different so cocktail is always sweeter yes and we're going to pour that in which gives it a real pretty color <laughs> thank you pot might be too small. a pot might be too small right well we don't well you know we got a couple more things to go into it but you know that's okay and i'll let you put that back over there and the next thing we want to put in is four tablespoons of lemon juice Hand me that lemon juice right there. And I use real lemon. And it says 100% lemon juice. So this will be four ounces. I've got it already, actually it's four tablespoons, excuse me, not four ounces, four tablespoons. I've got it measured out already. And we'll pour this in here. And the next thing we want a quarter cup of the brown sugar. Not this whole bag. This is not a quarter cup. This is actually a couple pounds, but this is a Dixie Crystal Pure Cane Sugar. So be sure you get that. And you're going to say, wow, that's going to be pretty sweet. No, not necessarily. So we will put this in and um, you know what? Make sure you get you a spoon to make sure you get this out. It's pre measure and we're not going to boil this so we're just going to simmer this it's not going to there we go that's a quarter cup of brown sugar now here comes a little bit of tricky uh, part let me kind of stir this up a little bit yes we're going to put it on the stove in a moment and let it simmer for about 20 minutes but now we got to do something a little tricky right there you're gonna need some string twine you say in yourself Sophie why right for the cheesecloth oh, she's so smart she's really a baker in disguise <laughs> I just watch a lot of food now right? yeah but also you can learn how to make a blackberry cobbler which is good okay and what you're going to do is not going to take much it's going to take about you know you you can buy this at any grocery store this is cheesecloth and you sterilize your scissors which they have been and we will cut just a strip okay and with this strip of uh, cheesecloth we're going to take uh let's see three cinnamon sticks that's what these are uh, you can get these McCormick's it's a good brand that's one we like and uh, make sure you open the top up before you get started on the show or anything like that it always helps oh that wasn't too bad was it okay and it says it calls for three of these so we'll get three sticks that looks like two sticks doesn't it let's get another stick of three sticks and this is cinnamon okay now it asks for one teaspoon of cloves we'll do the same thing with this one 
If you hear a grunting going on, it's the dog. <laughs> there we go. And again. Grab a spoon. You always need to have these things handy. And, and it says two teaspoon of cloves. So we will put two teaspoons of clove. Does it need to be accurate? Like super accurate? Uh, not can really. It can be a little less or it can be a little more. It's not going to. Uh, not, not, not too bad and what we want to do is let me move my I should have had this already done right here but I might have to cut some more we're going to wrap this up into your cheesecloth like so. I kind of like to turn it a little bit where it won't come out. And my sister's assistant here is going to tie that real tight. Good thing we got music in the background. Hum along. I did tell you I put music in the background. Oh, now you know. Okay, that's good. And what you're going to do is you're going to take this, put it inside, and what I usually do is I tie this around the handle of my pot because this way I can get it out without dipping down into it. And I'll tie this little knot here. I still want it to soak down into it. There we go. And now what we're going to do, you take your oven, not your oven, but your eye on your stove, and we're going to take it over, and you're not going to boil this. All you're going to do to it is let it simmer till it gets real hot. And the good thing about this is, if you don't want to drink all this, this is for like a little party, you can put it in your refrigerator and microwave it, heat it back up. So we're going to take this over to our stove, and what I'm going to do is take the wooden spoon and I want to stir it up a little bit because I still feel a little bit of the little bit of the brown sugar. We want to make sure that's stirred up real good. And as it heats up, it's going to melt that sugar into your into your cider. And we'll show you what it looks like here in a few moments. If you got a cold, this is good for a cold too, the spice in it. And we've got the timer set here. All right, after it sim simmers for 20 minutes, and you'll see the smoke, you see the smoke coming off of it now, it's ready. See, it didn't take long at all. And we're gonna taste it for you. I'm using soapy as a my guinea pig here, and uh, I don't know why they why they call it guinea pig for that. Because people use guinea pigs. So oh yeah, I guess so. We don't. Want to. Yeah, and I will got it. And here's uh now as Sophie makes a face, it's not because of the juice. Wanna <laughs> this? Okay, cheers. I love to help you cold. Oh, that's really good. The lemon, I can taste the lemon. Yeah. The sugar and the lemon and the spices in it, the cloves, you can kind of taste it all. So, to the pass my test? Oh yeah. Great. Definitely. Uh, you'll see at each end of the segments here, you will see the recipes. So you can get them off that. And this will be posted on YouTube and Facebook after it airs next Monday at seven o'clock. So stay tuned and watch it there.
and watch it on social media too. Well, I'm Jerry McKee. And I'm Sophie Mitchell. Merry Christmas. Alright guys, as always, prep your tin, you know what to do, butter and parchment. So the first cooking job that I ever had was working for a pastry chef and he made these incredible brownies and when you start working in kitchens they always say like write down the recipes because you're going to forget them later and of course I did not do that but there are a few things that I remember from his recipe that I really wanted to incorporate into our brownie recipe. Obviously, good brownies need good chocolate. And the chocolate bar you want to use is dealer's choice. You can go for something really mellow, like a milk chocolate bar, or go into something really, really dark, like an 80% dark chocolate would work really well in here. We're gonna double up on the chocolate, so we're gonna use cocoa powder as well. Because we wanted a really rich, dark flavor and color, we went with the Dutch processed. You can use regular cocoa powder here, but we're always looking for that intense flavor, that intense color. The one on the left used regular cocoa powder. It's kind of drier on top and almost like too dense and fudgy on the bottom. We're adding a little bit of cocoa powder here. We're gonna add even more later. Espresso powder just does a really great job of enhancing any chocolate flavor in a recipe. If you're worried about the caffeine, you can get a decaf powder as well. It's not gonna taste like coffee or espresso. It's really just another flavor enhancer. When we add the hot melted butter to the chocolate, cocoa powder, and espresso powder, it's going to help melt everything down and dissolve, which is going to help keep our brownies really fudgy later on. Sugars, we have granulated sugar, and then when deciding between light brown and dark brown, the real difference here is that dark brown has more molasses, ergo more flavor. I don't even know what ergo means. Again, just wanted to knock your socks off with the flavor here, and dark brown was the right one for the job. And we're also going to add a bit of salt as it brings out the flavor in any baked good. So we're going to have six eggs. Always crack your eggs into a separate bowl in case you get any shell. Best way to remedy that is to use the eggshell. It breaks the surface tension and is the easiest way to get eggshell out of your eggs. You can start by adding one egg to the sugar just so you don't make a huge mess. Once you get it going though, you can add the rest of them. No big deal. You don't have to be like super careful like you would for a cake, for instance. So working for that pastry chef, one thing that he did with his brownies was he would beat the living crap out of the eggs and sugar and really, really incorporate tons of air. So much so that it would look like a super thick pancake batter almost. This is what happens when you don't beat the sugar and the eggs. It kind of just falls really flat, right? The great thing about beating the eggs and the sugar is you create like a really solid foundation and you don't have to use a chemical leavener. And then you're gonna pour in that beautiful ganache that we made. Oh my God. Actually, when we were shooting this, there is a crowd of people around us because we couldn't get over how insanely delicious this looked. Oh God, I just, I can't believe we baked these. Honestly, like I could have just eaten the batter myself. 
I'm really upset that America can't get on the metric system, but like fine. So <laughs> if we're gonna use cups, always scoop and level to make sure that we had the right amount of flour. If you just take the cup straight into the flour, it's gonna be denser than you need it to be. And you're going to sift the flour and the cocoa powder into the mixture to make sure we have no lumps and just make sure that we're really quickly incorporating it into the rest of the batter. And fold. Because we beat all that air in with the eggs, we don't want to totally deflate that. So just get the dry ingredients incorporated as quickly as you can. Pour the completed batter into your prepped tin. Smooth it out to make sure everything's pretty level. And into the oven it goes. So these are gonna rise quite a bit. After about 20 minutes, we're gonna take them out. This is like my favorite tip of the whole recipe. Take the brownies out and slam them on your kitchen counter. It's gonna crack the top as well as evens out everything and you get a much more like consistent texture. These are the same recipe. The one on the left is not whacked, right whacked. At this point, we're also going to add a bit of sea salt, optional but highly recommended. It adds a little salty bite, sweet and salty, always good. With a lot of baked goods, you'll stick a toothpick in and no batter remains and you're good. It's kind of not the case with these brownies. You will have a good amount of kind of fudginess that comes out on the toothpick. Trust us, they've been in there for like 45 minutes. They're definitely cooked through. They're just fudgy. When they do cool down, they also will deflate quite a bit. It results in a really even texture all throughout. Again, I can't say fudgy enough. Like, I don't even like fudge. Little known thing about me, but these brownies are like insane. I need to cut things nice. They need to be like a good, perfect square. It's so satisfying to see like a perfectly cut batch of brownies, obviously. Oh my gosh. A little tip too, it's to clean your knife after each cut. So you'll see a little bit of that fudginess comes off. They're fudgy, but they're not dense. And that is it. I mean, look at that texture. Look at it. This is like your go-to brownie batter. It's amazing as is, but you can also mix in anything that you want. More chocolate chunks, potato chips, pretzels. This is like a phenomenal like standard brownie recipe, but feel free to go crazy and mix in whatever you want. Making brownies from scratch, you know, there's other options out there that are easier, but it's like one of those fundamental baked goods that doesn't take a ton of technique, but they also kind of like go with everything. Well, I hope you enjoyed the great recipe and now it will make your holidays even better uh, with the Christmas coming around the corner. We just got through with Thanksgiving. We all filled up with that. But these right here are going to be some extra treats for you during your Christmas holiday. Did you enjoy the food? Oh, yeah. We always enjoy the food. So what I hope you to watch next week is something going to be exciting. And it's going to be fast. And what is it going to be, Sophie? We are racing NASCARs, right? Right. And guess who's going to be driving one? Sophie. That's right. People say women can't drive. She's an expert driver. And uh, she gets to get a little speed underneath her foot now when she goes to Charlotte Speedway only. And uh, so we'll be bringing you that, some drone sh uh, uh, shots, and uh, from the Rusty Wallace Racing Extreme. We thank them and Charlotte Motor Speedway for inviting us down. So stay tuned next week for a fast, fast, exciting show. And we've got a couple other things to throw in there too. So you stay tuned for next Monday. I'm Jerry McKee. And I'm Sophie Mitchell. And thank you for watching Down Home with Jerry McKee. Good night.